Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm, I am recording this, so this will be available after um, for everyone who is unable to join us on this beautiful Friday. My name is Janine Burke Wells. I'm the executive director of the Northeast Biosolids and Residuals Association. And I am welcoming you to our 24th Northeast Digestion Roundtable, which uh, Nebra has been hosting since 2016 now. Uh, we sponsor these quarterly meetings to share technical and operational experiences and advance best practices for anaerobic digestion. Um, today, we have a panel of speakers. Um, you know, we, we are all about promoting beneficial reuse and resource recovery, which is why we love anaerobic digestion. Um, and today, we have a panel of speakers, which is a little different. And uh, But our topic today is regional trends in anaerobic digestion for food wastes, and especially co-digestion with wastewater sludges. Our panel today will be further introduced and facilitated by Nora Goldstein, who is the editor of BioCycle Magazine, and Corianne Mansell, a client services strategist at the Center for Ecotechnology in Massachusetts. Um, you'll get to hear a little bit more about CET's Northeast Anaerobic Digestion Accelerator Project. Um, and the two have invited a few guests. Today we have, including uh, Brett Reinford with Reinford Farms, Thomas Darby with the Hermitage Municipal Authority of Wastewater Treatment Utility, Nat Harris of the Compost Plant, and John Fisher of the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so this isn't really a webinar, it's more of a round table format. There will definitely be time at the end for some questions and discussions. So, uh, but if you have any, Thing you want to add into the chat, go feel free to do that. I'll keep an eye on the chat for the speakers. Everyone should be muted as you join us here. I'm going to ask you to just stay on mute until the end of the panel discussion when I can open it up and you can chat with the panelists directly. Uh, I mentioned this is being recorded and we'll forward this out to you after the fact and put it out on the Netter webpage. And with that, I would like to turn the meeting over to Nora and Corianne. Sure, thank you for um, inviting us to this conversation and joining us this afternoon. I will get us started. I'll share my screen in just a moment to walk through some of the uh, initiatives and resources that we developed with the support from EPA for our Northeast Anaerobic Digestion Accelerator project. And then I'll hand it over to Nora who will kick us off uh, with the first pan uh, question for our panelists. All right. One moment, please. All right, everyone seeing and hearing me? Or seeing yes. the slides? <laughs> yes, All right. it's beautiful. So thank you, Janine and uh, Nibra for inviting us to talk to this talk series. Uh, as introduced, I'm Corianne Mansell, the Client Services Strategist at the Center for Ecotechnology. And also, as I mentioned, I'll be briefly highlighting our Northeast Anaerobic Digestion Accelerator Project, which is supported by EPA's funding to support anaerobic digestion in, community, in communities. And thus far, this project has really led to measurable tons out of the waste, waste stream uh, for organics and increased understanding of anaerobic digestion as a solution to wasted food and also long lasting partnerships. A bit about our organization, we are the Center for Ecotechnology or CET, uh, which is a nonprofit that helps people and businesses save energy and reduce waste. We've been doing this for over 45 years, uh, helping businesses and institutions on the ground implement sound, diversion recycling programs, while also uh, contributing to effective public policy on these efforts. This work is really not possible without our tremendous partners, uh, including state agencies across the country, and especially uh, recognize John Fisher with the MassDEP, cities, foundations, utility companies, and the federal government, of course, such as EPA. 
Here is a map of the states where we're do, uh, conducting work across the country, of course, to varied degrees depending on our partnerships. Our services really fall within these three categories or these three pillars. Uh, one is that technical assistance where we're meeting with businesses and institutions one-on-one -on -one to understand what their needs are and being a matchmaker to the solutions that are going to be most uh, beneficial for them. And then providing those training resources that support the long lasting success of those programs that are implemented across of the EPA food recovery hierarchy that's shown here. And also customized signage. Then we look to content development, where because we're interfacing with the business community and hearing what their challenges are, as well as being that matchmaker with solution providers, we're also hearing the needs in the marketplace and developing content that it addresses those needs. So guidance documents on food donation or source separation, which I'll, I'll preview in just a moment. And then capacity building. Uh, recognizing that, yes, we have this library and this toolbox of resources, but how do we get out there and engage businesses so that they're inspired and motivated to also start their own, start or expand their own programs? Here's a brief lineage of kind of the services that we provide when we're uh, working one on one with a business through that technical assistance, which is available at no cost thanks to our partners. Uh, again, identifying those opportunities across the waste stream and across the waste hierarchy, creating customized waste bin signage, cost impact analyses, and much more. An example of that, which was supported by this grant uh, or this initiative, uh, Northeast Anaerobic Digestion Accelerator Project, is our work with Connecticut Valley Hospital. And with our uh, assistance, they were able to partner with Blue Earth Compost, which now takes the hospital's scraps for processing at an anaerobic digestion facility nearby. We also provided signage for the new system and helped train the, the staff inter internally for these new processes. We also um, really intended for the Rhode Island, Rhode Island Schools Recycling Club, we created an overview of the di anaerobic digestion process. Uh, as Rhode Island Schools Recycling Club was working with K through 12 schools across Rhode Island, they were hearing more and more questions around the process of anaerobic digestion. What does that mean? Is it applicable for, for my school? And so this certainly aligned with our grant objectives to increase understanding of anaerobic digestion as one of the solutions to wasted food. So hopefully uh, that breakdown is, you know, straight to the point, you know, concise uh, and really can help those, those schools that are um, ha having those questions. Another document that we produced uh, within this project period is specific guidance for source separation food scraps for anaerobic digestion. And so the guidance includes best practices for source separating in the kitchen, uh, hauler collections and frequency of pickups, outdoor storage practices, as well as the frequently asked questions when collecting food scraps specifically for anaerobic digestion. So one uh, question that comes up is uh, the partnerships with depackaging technology. Well, we really emphasize in this stuff in this document, prioritization of source separation first and foremost, and not over relying on these depackaging technologies, although abundant and wonderful, certainly as a solution, uh, we also kind of navigate that conversation in this document. And this document, uh, as especially recognize Nora here who helped lead the development of this content for the Northeast Anaerobic Digestion Accelerator Food Waste Digestion Insights, uh, where she had conversations with many anaerobic digestion technologies and oper operators across the Northeast to summarize uh, best practices, the marketplace, and also do a few spotlights on, on these partners um, that also bridges that awareness and understanding of the options that are available across the Northeast. And one last highlight that I'll share is we also wanted to build partnerships and collaboration among the organic waste haulers across the Northeast. And so to do so in year one of the grant, we organized a series of hauler working group sessions to hear their interests and challenges, invite featured speakers uh, into the space 
to share their learnings and their models that could be replicated and offer uh, virtual networking uh, and matchmaking, if you will, between organic waste haulers or those that are growing into the, the space. So thank you for allocating some time to hear about what we've been working on with the support from EPA. Uh, and I hope you share those resources widely that I'll certainly put in the, in the chat. We're here to assist, but at this time I'll, I'll hand it over to Nora to kick us off and hear from the panelists, which you all came here to hear from. Thank you, Corey, and, and thank you, Janine, for, for this opportunity to chat with the a bunch of folks, some of who I saw names that I haven't seen run into you in a long time. So hope everybody's well. Um, what we're going to do to get started is a round of introductions uh, to our panelists uh, and uh, just have them explain or briefly describe where they intersect, where and how they intersect with food waste, uh, the food waste digestion landscape in the Northeast. So uh, we'll start with Nat Harris with the compost plant. Thanks, Nora. Hello, everyone. Great to see everyone here and uh, appreciate you having us. Uh, so compost plant, we started 10 years ago uh, as a vertically integrated business thinking, uh, you know, we would haul the food waste process to make compost and sell compost. And we kind of, as we got along in the business, realized that real opportunity is in connecting uh, the producers of food waste with the processors. And that also within the Northeast anyway, the, the farmland just doesn't exist, in our opinion, to process you know, all the food waste that's out there. So really kind of seeing anaerobic digestion as uh, the way to scale our business because we need outlets obviously for what we're collecting. Um, so we did 6,500 tons last year, million, 1.4 million revenue, 10 employees, five trucks on the road, and we're really going after now um, the hauling aspect of what we do. Um, we've been recently permitted for uh, a pre-processing facility here in Providence where we have all of our equipment to do a little pre-processing of the food waste um, to facilitate being able to transport it a little more efficiently to the digesters that are in the region, some of them that are further afield uh, than us. So that's where we're, where we're at. We're excited uh, for all the action that's happening within the AD space and happy to be part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, next, uh, Brett, Brett Reinford with Reinford Farms. Thanks, Nora. Yes, um, my name is Brett. I am a dairy farmer in central Pennsylvania, just north of Harrisburg. Um, we uh, started inter, um, intersecting with uh, food waste in 2008 after we built our first um, anaerobic digester to um, really we built it to, to kind of reduce the odor on our farm. But we, we got a call from a broker that managed um, Walmart's food waste and we agreed to start taking about two loads a day from Walmart. Uh, and that lasted for about nine years. Um, and in that process of taking food waste from Walmart, there was a lot of contamination uh, in the source separated um, product that we were getting. And so uh, in 2017, uh, we built a DPAC facility. And then in 2019, we, we basically tripled the size of our digester by building another digester next to it to be able to handle more food waste as well as cow manure. So, um, so last year we recycled about 35,000 tons of packaged food waste. Um, we have a, a trucking company um, as well that, that hauls probably 80% of what we bring in here. Um, and uh, with our food waste, we're making about 500 uh, KW an hour of um, electricity. So, that's kind of the end use um, as far as what we do with the energy. And then the, the rest is land applied as fertilizer on our acreage. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Tom, Tom Darby with the uh, Hermit, uh, can't talk, uh, head of this Hermitage Municipal Authority. Thanks, Nora. Uh, yeah, we began, uh, it sounds like we all began about the same time, 2008, 2010. Uh, and planning to uh, add food waste to our, our existing 
uh, anaerobic digesters. Um, and uh, 2014, we really went online uh, receiving uh, free consumer uh, food waste, uh, fast food uh, that uh, was never delivered because of expiration date and, and expired dairy products. Uh, so just about anything that, uh, that that was out of date or had an issue with it, we started to take it. Um, we uh, we have three different depackers, uh, depending on the type of product we get in. Uh, one's a perforator, one is a, uh, um, a centrifugal uh, hammer mill process, and the last one is a, a uh, auger system, which presses the organics out of the packaging through screens. Uh, we're averaging right now about 500 tons a month of uh, food waste. Uh, we can probably go up a couple hundred tons uh, once we get uh, uh, to full operation here. We're putting some new domes on two of our tanks. Um, but uh, we also are generating electricity with it. We've looked at, uh, originally we looked at injection into the gas pipeline uh, or uh, uh, doing a CNG uh, process. Uh, we went with the, the electrical generation. Uh, which offsets our uh, basically uh, uh, our monthly electric use from the utility, um, except for the transportation and the, the other uh, fees that go along with that. So uh, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty uh, fun watching all this unravel. If 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 food waste and wastewater uh, combining those two can be fun, uh, we've we've managed to make it that way. Um, and and I guess that's the last, uh, the bottom line of all this is we still uh, discharge uh, a Class A biosolid, uh, which is being utilized by farmers and our, our uh, discharge effluent um, has uh, uh, been uh, right on target with our NPDES permit. We've had no issues with that. So basically we're a municipal operation uh, running a small business, which helps offset our our uh, customers' fees. We have not had a rate increase since 2013 uh, because of the revenue we're generating from the food waste tipping fees and the uh, creation of electricity. I'll stop there for now. <laughs> oh, it's great. All your introductions were great. Um, and finally, John Fisher with the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Great. Uh, thanks, Nora. So uh, we've been working, um, you know, as with, with others, uh, we've been working on food waste for, for quite a while at MassDEP. Uh, my real <clears throat> direct role with, with food waste really picked up in 2011, 2012. We had a statewide solid waste master plan that we were finalizing. We had launched um, uh, our Recycling Works in Massachusetts program at that time, which uh, Corey uh, works on at CET and CET has been administering. So we we launched that uh, business technical assistance program. And then uh, we had our initial uh, commercial food waste disposal ban take effect in 2014. That was for businesses and institutions that dispose of one ton or more food waste per week, about 2000 businesses in Massachusetts. And uh, just last fall in November, we expanded that ban, lowered the threshold, to a half ton per week. And we estimate that's bringing in about another 2000 businesses who will be subject to the ban. Uh, we've seen um, in the early years of our infrastructure, uh, most of our food waste was going to either animal feed or composting. Uh, since the ban has taken effect, more and more of our food waste is going to anaerobic digestion. The biggest area of growth with AD has been these farm-based AD systems. Although we do have one uh, one standalone system at a distribution center, we do have one uh, wastewater treatment plant that's taking slurried food waste, and we have a small AD facility co-sited uh, at a landfill with a landfill uh, gas operation. But you know, the bulk of them are farm-based AD operations. Um, going forward, we're you know we're we're still working with the larger and medium-sized generators to get their food waste separated. Uh, but but as we look, you know, kind of down um, to, you know, smaller sources, small businesses and residents, you know, I think 
the the infrastructure needs are going to be somewhat different. It's it's almost like a different material from our perspective. So, um, you know, we need to think very differently about the collection infrastructure. And, you know, I, I think we need to think a little bit differently about the intake of the material going either compost, animal feed, or AD uh, to make sure it's going to meet the specs of the facilities it's going to. Uh, you know, part of the reason we started with the largest ones is it was more cost effective to collect it. But the other part of the reason is a little easier to keep tabs on quality and contamination from 2,000 entities versus 6.8 million. So, um, you know, we we kind of felt, you know, larger businesses was the right place to start. But, you know, as we go, we have really aggressive food waste reduction goals. It is still, despite all our progress, it's still the largest segment of our of our municipal solid waste. So we have a lot more work to do. I'll just share my my favorite stat. We've had a tonnage increase in food waste diversion and stuff like that. My The one I like the best is that when we started, we had 1,350, 1350 businesses separating food waste. And as of the last year's data we have available, that went up to 3,500. So more than double the number of businesses separating food waste. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, looking forward to the next year of data soon and hopefully you know, seeing some continued growth with that. Wonderful. Well, thank you again all for your introductions. Uh, for the first bit of uh, this roundtable, Corey and I are, are going to just put out a, a few questions that we uh, uh, to sort of get a little bit more background on the and the landscape, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions from everybody participating. So first question, uh, and it is from your vantage points, um, are you seeing, uh, is the trend for anaerobic digestion of food waste in the Northeast increasing? Um, for example, are you seeing, and John, you just alluded to this more on-farm idea of food waste. Are we seeing more wastewater treatment plant um, and more standalone food waste digesters? Uh, the one that's getting started up in Rhode Island, uh, there's New Jersey, Maryland. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll switch up the order just a little, uh, just so, you know, catch you off guard. Uh, so Brett, just curious, what's from your vantage point, do you see uh, AD of food waste increasing? Uh, yes, absolutely. So probably in the last three months, I've gotten calls from maybe 10 different farmers here in Pennsylvania that are seriously considering AD and just wanted some pointers from me and what we've learned over the years. Um, there's, uh, I, I know of a, um, a couple um, digesters that are potentially going out on farms um, that are, will be investor owned um, here in Pennsylvania. Um, so, uh, and they're all coming online probably as soon as the, the permitting process is done. So yeah, huge, um, huge increase in the last, um, I would say six months of, of general interest from on-farm on farm digesters. Uh, so I think in Pennsylvania, we have a little over 30 right now. I would expect that number to increase significantly in the next five years. Wow, we might overtake Wisconsin in Pennsylvania. So we might overtake it's, it's Wisconsin. Possible. I think it was Wisconsin that had has always had the most, but uh, yep. excellent. How about, um, let me see, Tom, what about you? Are you seeing a, an increase? Sadly, oh. <laughs> it, we're not seeing um, an increase in uh, uh, food waste, anaerobic digestion uh, processes, but I'm looking at it from a completely different perspective than Brett. Uh, we're a municipal wastewater operation. Um, I don't see any, at least in Western Pennsylvania, municipal operations who want to adopt what we're doing. Um, there has been interest in uh, uh, private businesses concerns getting into doing this. It's a uh, obviously a for profit uh, driven uh, um, uh, process, but uh, municipalities, uh, the, there's the, um, the feeling that, you know, I, I, all I want to do is run a wastewater plant. Why would I want to take on something new? Um, it's not going to benefit me, uh, but it may benefit the community, but I, I still have a job regardless. So it's overcoming that whole mindset of uh, doing the same old thing every day, just because you meet your, your discharge limits and 
and you don't have any problems with your biosolids, uh, well, that's probably the perfect uh, situation to get into food waste because you you can adapt and and begin to grow revenue for your community. Um, I don't see any new plants out this way uh, that are that are adopting that that strategy uh, or have an interest in it. I, and I have I feel like the, the food waste energy evangelist out here uh, trying to get different communities and and I go to conferences and speak on everybody seems really excited and then they leave. Um, so uh, again, sadly, no, we're not seeing an increase in it here in, in the municipal sector. Interesting. No, it it's uh, it seems also I know in in New England it's uh, Janine was saying it's a limited a a limited number of digesters and uh, it, it may only be one that's that's actually doing taking in food waste. Uh, Nat, how how about you from where you sit? Um, are you seeing an increase of of anaerobic digestion of food waste? Yeah, so we I mean, we um, we work with Vanguard Renewables, and um, you know they they've got substantial investment to roll out more digesters across the the country, and are quite excited by that. Uh, divert also got a lot of investment, and then here locally in Rhode Island, the energy of Digester and Johnston, which uh, has been through many different owners, uh, technology didn't seem to be right from day one. But Energia is, you know, we work pretty closely with them and they're investing around $37 million to make it right. So I think uh, obviously they, they see, all three of those companies see, see the, the growth potential and opportunities for it. Excellent, thank you. And uh, John, how about you? And you, <clears throat> excuse me, you touched on this a little bit, but anything you might wanna add? Sure, so, so we absolutely, have seen a growth to date. Um, I'm not aware of any projects that are out there right now for new AD facilities taking food waste and mass. Doesn't mean there aren't, I just, nothing that I'm immediately aware of. But we have heard from a couple that want to maybe expand what they're doing and maybe switch to a larger engine and things like that. Uh, so there's maybe potential for some of the existing ones to expand and take a little bit more, ramp up their generation. There was also a comment in the chat that I think is kind of relevant here, which is, you know, how far um, might food waste travel or should food waste travel? And I think that's question for us is not just how much food waste capacity there is statewide, but where is it relative to where the food waste is being generated? And most of our AD facilities are in the central western part of the state. Most of our food waste, the most concentrated food waste is in the eastern third of the state. So there's a little bit of a disconnect between the geographic location of the facilities and where the food waste is coming from. So we've also seen some interest in facilities that are like intermediate processing or slurring type operations, or even just like kind of straight up transfer, uh, just to, to move food waste from where it's being generated more efficiently to some of the outlets. So we might, you know, perhaps see something um, along those lines developing. I've seen a couple um, uh, expressions of interest from companies to to do that recently. I don't think either has moved forward, but um, I would expect something like that to move forward sooner rather than later. Excellent. Corey, over to you for the next question. All right. And I'll also change up the order to keep us on our toes. Uh, so now we want to be thinking about uh, each uh, represented state here and talking about the state's regulatory climate for anaerobic digestion of food waste. Is it favorable, unfavorable? And some examples might include the ease of getting a permit or meeting contamination limits, et cetera. And then with that in mind, you know, on that regulatory climate, what support is available in your state uh, to develop anaerobic digestion technology? So I will start with uh, Tom here. Uh, so I have, and, and this could go along with uh, my previous answer, um, in, in not seeing municipal operations, I, I don't see any state encouragement to do this. Um, the, the process, uh, when we first permitted uh, our 
our system, not first, but when we were renewing our permit at the same time we were uh, building our food waste to energy um, processes, uh, DEP took a long look at what we were doing and, and trying to decide how to permit us. Um, so it, it, it ended up, we got our NPDES permit renewed, um, but they were also looking at uh, a solid waste kind of a, a process as well. Um, so with that, I think the, the state level has not found a way or has not shown a lot of interest in encouraging uh, municipal facilities to get into um, food waste diversion, energy creation, um, uh, removing uh, organics from landfills. Uh, the dairy farmers, I think, is a great resource for, for receiving this, as well as composting. It doesn't have to be a municipal operation. It could be a private, uh, but there there isn't the... Uh, um, the there's no incentive at this point to get into it. Okay, and then from a, a different perspective, I'll I'll hand it over to John here. Well, I'm, I may not be the best person to ask for opinions about our own regulations because I think they're perfect. I think they're right on. Um, but. Uh, you know, you probably want to ask Vanguard or Agrid or something like that and get get their take about that. Um, but, you know, seriously, we did um, when we were rolling out our food waste ban, we did change our regulations back in 2012 to develop specific categories of permits for composting and AD. Previously, there was kind of it was kind of murky about what those facilities were. And one of the things we did is we said, if you're taking source separated materials, you're not a solid waste facility needing different types of permits from us. That's something called either a general permit at a small scale, which is basically like a certification or something called a recycling composting or conversion or RCC facility permit if you're a little bit larger. Um, and the one thing that, that I'll say is that we have had AD facilities get successfully cited in Mass and, and a bunch of them. And Massachusetts is not an easy place to cite facilities in general. It's a uh, it's challenging landscape, both at the state and local level. So. I, I do feel pretty happy that we've had so many facilities move forward. So I, I think that's a good thing. Uh, we have put some uh, grant and loan dollars towards the AD facility development. Greater Lawrence Sanitary District, I think, got funding from three different state agencies to move forward with their AD project. And we also funded the uh, some put some funding towards the slurry operation that's sending material there. We're actually just about any day now. We're about to announce a round of grants that are focused on collection of food materials. So we're trying to focus on that part of the infrastructure as well. We've also done some grants along the way, um, both for AD, grants and loans for AD, uh, but then also composting as well. We're supporting composting as well. And I know this isn't, your, isn't our focus here, but we're also trying to foster the uh, um, food road reduction and um, rescue and donation infrastructure as well. We, we feel like we need kind of all of these, um, all of these channels to manage food materials and get you know, all of them um, getting to uh, the solid waste stream. So I like to think we're we're, we're doing a good job, but, um, you know, I think the, the proof that we're doing at least an okay job is we, we've seen a really good growth in AD capacity, so we feel good about that. Um, but uh, again, yeah, you might want to ask others about their take on our regs versus me. Well, it's help, helpful to hear from you and certainly brought up good points. Uh, I'll hand it to Nat. Yeah, and John, to speak to your earlier comment, we uh, we just recently got permitted to build a slurry machine here uh, at our warehouse. So all our food waste will come here, get slurry, just so that we can transport it, you know, further afield uh, and, and in an economic way. Um, so going through that process, we had to work with the Rhode Island DEM to um, get permitted under what they call a bud permit, which is a beneficial use determination permit um, where, uh, you know, a, a solid waste has, you know, a, a higher end use. And so going through that process was interesting, uh, a lot of education on, you know, what exactly it was we wanted to do. Um, but 
very receptive, very supportive um, in that. Took took a while, but th that was it's probably understandable. Um, and then the food waste bans we have here in Rhode Island, you know, so th that goes back to 2015. And you know, I think the community understands the importance of, of getting food waste diverted and out of the landfill. Um, at least from our perspective here in Rhode Island, that seems like a we could use some more support. I, I wish we were in Massachusetts, but uh, I think Rhode Island is it's getting there. Thank you, and and Brett. Yeah, I um, I wish I had three hours to talk about this. Um, so I'll look at it from from two different perspectives. Or so I'm looking at it from a, a dairy farm perspective. Um, so as far as as being able to install a digester. I think it took us about nine months to get all the permits that we needed to actually be able to install a digester, but that all depends on your county and your township in our in our area where we live in Pennsylvania. It was um, relatively easy. Um, ironically, the hardest permit to get was the air quality permit to install a digester, which if I were to build a manure pit, I don't need a permit and I can release methane to the air, but if I build a digester, I have to go through a bunch of hoops to be able to collect the methane. So that, stuff like that doesn't make sense to me. But um, and then from the the food waste side of things, um, uh, so we kind of pioneered the, the the packager here in Pennsylvania. I, Tom probably operates um, under a different permit that I operate under, as far as having a, a depackager on our site, and um, that was a challenge that took. Um, I think three years to get that done. And, um, you know, um, the contamination limits uh, is have to be at zero to be able to operate my depackager, which um, I think everyone that owns a depackager knows that's probably not possible. We've taken a lot of steps to really mitigate the microplastics that are coming through, including smaller screen sizes, or smaller screens and, and, and secondary screens as well. Um, but uh, it was uh, it was quite the challenge, and um, yeah, so it's it's not the easiest thing to do. I guess there's uh, definitely a lot of um, regulatory things that we we have to do here, and 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 honestly, I think a lot of that was just kind of the unknowns. Um, this is relatively new technology, and there's a lot of things that still need to be figured out. So I think everyone was being very cautious as we went through the permitting process. But that's kind of my take on where it stands right now. Thank you all for these insights. Over to you, Nora. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to ask this last round of questions for now and then open it up so everybody participating has a chance. And then if we have time, we're going to lob a final question, but um, we'll, we'll play that, play that loose. Um, and because I forgot what order, um, I, we, we've been going in, um, which is very common for me to forget. Uh, what the, I just wanted to, um, if each of you could address what you see as a, you know, a top barrier, maybe two barriers to really either expand if you're interested in expanding, just make it easier to, to function day to day and do, do your business. Um, as well as the top opportunities. And it's interesting, the couple of, you know, Brett and Tom have noted they're generating electricity. Do you, and Tom, you said you evaluated uh, doing renewable natural gas, but is that an opportunity? I'm not saying you have to answer that specifically, but um, again, just sort of to summarize for all of us, barriers and opportunity. And I'm going to start with, um, nah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I think uh, for us, you know, ha having a reliable place to, to take food waste after it's been collected is key. Obviously, you have to deal with it pretty quickly. Um, so the digester here has been through a lot of start and stops and they're having trouble as they get things sorted out. And um, that's kind of held us back in terms of really going after some of the larger accounts that are in the area. And thus the reason for us um, to build the slurry machine so that we have the ability to go 
you know, further afield with what we're collecting, have a little more control over our, our feedstock as we collect it. And I mean, the opportunity simply is there's a lot of food waste out there that's um, could be managed better uh, and, and collected by us, hopefully. And then so um, that's really driving our desire to, to really ramp up the hauling collection aspect. Um, but we but we need reliable outlets, and it goes goes to farms too. We still work with some compost commercial compost operations, um, and uh, they've been having neighbor troubles as well, and, um, zoning issues. So there's there's always pressure uh, on the outlet side for us, and so if we can get a little more control of it, uh, we th we think we'll be better off. Excellent. Thank you, John. How about how about uh, from your perspective. I'm going to maybe circle back to something I, I alluded to earlier. Um, so as we go, you know, we're, we're kind of um, shifting our focus to smaller sources of food waste. And uh, in doing so, the, the collection uh, logistics and economics are, are totally different for collecting at that scale. And, and also the material quality, I, th I think is more difficult to stay on top of. Um, and most of our AD facilities are taking in food waste that's um, you know, in, uh, in liquid tankers. So it's, it's being pumped into the digester by, you know, by a hose, for a hose. Um, and so you either need to have more capacity at the AD facilities to slurry that material on site to be able to introduce it into the digester, or you need other kind of intermediate facilities to do that and then, you know, transport that via tanker trucks to the AD. So, and in the course of doing so, you know, Corey mentioned the, the, the goal of trying to stay on top of contamination at the source. I, I still think that's really important. I think it's a mistake to become lazy at the point of the generator and rely on DPAC to clean up, you know, just a bunch of trash mixed in with your food waste. That's, I think we have to do a little better than that with the collection. And um, so to me, that's, you know, as we go, I think we've, we've made a lot of great progress with the largest generators and we, we just need to maybe kind of shift gears a little bit and rethink our approach as we start dealing with much more generators where we're getting fewer food waste at each collection stop. Excellent, excellent. No, there's, uh, it's funny, man, I'll put a link to an article we had recently about a proposed uh, policy in Vermont where they would distinguish what food waste should really stay in a source separation category and define what goes to DPAC. And just an interesting way to look at kind of getting to uh, what you're talking about, John. Um, let's see, how about uh, Tom? Yep. Uh, well, I'm gonna echo uh, what John just said about uh, uh, storage of the of the material. Um, we we um, extremely underestimated how much holding capacity we would need uh, back in 2008 when, when design took place. Uh, so we have an existing 35,000 gallon tank that we can easily fill ourselves each day. Um, but if I get a call in the afternoon of a tanker with 5,000 gallons of uh, uh, beer, wine, and, and pop blended together, um, I don't have a, a tank to put that in. Um, and I really want that kind of stuff. Um, so that's one of our, our issues, and we're dealing with that at the moment, uh, possibly be building a larger storage tank to go with the one we have. Uh, the other uh, issues that we deal with are the, the power generation because we are generating electricity. Uh, we're limited at our facility, facility of how much we can uh, produce by a 500 kW transformer that's owned by the local energy company, First Energy. Um, we were in the process of having that upgraded to 1000 kW uh, we have two engines that we can run simultaneously, but uh, at the at the moment we have to throttle one back so that we're under that 500 kW limit. Um, 
we have in fact popped two of those 500 kW transformers in the past by trying to, to uh, maximize our production. Uh, we don't have to pay for them. The energy company replaces them, but uh, I think uh, we, we will cut their losses if they'll put in a thousand for us. Um, transportation is also an issue. We, we do get calls for materials um, that uh, they have no way of getting them to us. As a municipality, we don't have a collection system or, or a process to go out and pick up food waste. Um, we've looked at it. We've tried to uh, find ways to, to justify doing that, um, but the stream is not steady uh, of food waste and uh, financially it's not something that we can take on. Um, so there are, there are a lot of those kind of, I would call them smaller facilities who don't have the, the transportation that that would get involved with what we're doing if they had access to getting the material here at an, a fair price. Um, there's lots of other obstacles, but I'll stop with those. Wonderful. And, and Brett, I don't think I called on you. I was so wrapped up in listening. <laughs> Hey, no problem. Um, I'll, I know we're short on time here, so I'll, I'll make it quick. So the, the big, you know, the big thing that's, um, that's a top area is just the cost of what it, what it, what it costs to install a digester anymore. Um, we're looking at upgrading our, our 500 kW motor to another 500 kW motor, and it's nearly double the cost of what it was four years ago. So um, it's just, you know, it just seems like my prices can't keep up with how fast things are increasing as far as cost. Um, and then, you know, another concern that we have is the reliability of food waste. So, you know, right now it, it shows up, but as more and more digesters come online and DPAC um, facilities, you know, are we going to have a consistent supply of food waste to run our digesters? And so, um, so that's that's kind of a concern, and then I think I think one of the top opportunities, as everyone has kind of talked about already, is is the logistics side of of how food waste moves. Um, you know, we're we're into hauling it as well, but I, there's a lot of things that I think everyone can do better logistically to get food waste to where it needs to be uh, cheaper and more efficiently. So um, I think that's a that's a big opportunity for someone out there. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for answering our questions. I think we'll just jump right into. Uh, all those who've been listening uh, to take your questions and and uh, we may take that to the top of the hour. So um, Janine, do you want? Yeah, there were a few questions, uh, certainly a couple we can bang out pretty quickly um, for maybe Nat or Brett. Um, there was a question about feedstocks. If there's a better uh, food waste feedstock for anaerobic digestion versus composting. I, so we like to take, uh, well, Tom talked about it. He talked about beer and juice and wine. So that's all a wonderful, wonderful stuff for making energy. Um, dairy products um, also create a lot of gas. Um, you know, anything that's that's liquid or semi-liquid seems to be a good good source for, um, for making uh, methane, if that's what your goal is to do. Yeah, and th that's... Something we're excited about is with our slurry machine, we'll have 30,000 gallons of storage capacity for a homogeneous mix of everything we're collecting. And can we start testing that uh, slurry to give the digesters some, you know, a heads up as to what, you know, what they might be looking for or what might be coming their way? And could we, uh, you know, could we custom tailor blends? Um, in that, you know, using that equipment, which I, th I think could be interesting to explore. Yeah. Yeah, cool stuff. Um, there was a question, this one's probably for John, is um, if there's any uh, concerns from a regulatory point of view on contaminants of emerging concern, any particular ones that you're looking at um, in food waste and co-digestion situations? know the question mentioned PFAS so yes I didn't um, want to have I, I haven't said it once yet today yeah I was trying not to bring it up um <laughs> so but obviously we're concerned about PFAS everywhere because it's everywhere um so so far it hasn't been been a big um focus for ours relative to 
uh, to food waste in particular. I do think, you know, one of the things to think about with food waste stream is the more packaging you're getting mixed in, the more potential for PFAS. And hopefully, you know, down the road that it's going to be reduced in packaging through legislative initiatives. We're not going to have to worry about that as much. That's certainly the, you know, better way to go. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely coming up on, on the wastewater side as well. That's not my area, so I'm not as immersed in it, but, uh, you know, that that's coming up across, kind of across the board. Um, the other thing I, I haven't heard about in a while, that's, that's not really a toxic thing, but a little bit different, is just about the um, nutrient uh, levels of digestate coming out. And I think at one point there was maybe concerns about phosphorus levels from certain facilities on certain farms, kind of in context of their nutrient management plans, which is also not my world, but, you know, kind of my, my sense was that phosphorus, even though really valuable and, you know, scarce in some areas was, you know, may, maybe high in, in certain places. So I, I think, that, you know, something like that's just an interesting question. You know, are, are there any kind of nutrient limits on, you know, how AD digestate is being applied? I think, you know, with, with AD, probably more of the emphasis has been on the value of the energy, but certainly having a, a place to use a digestate in a, in a farm environment is really, really important. So being able to get value out of the digestate and, and be able to use that well is, uh, is important. Yeah, great question. Um, I'm just going to put a plug in for our research committee here at Nebro. We're going to be hearing from a researcher in Waterloo University next month on PFAS and contaminants of emerging concern through the AD process. So we'll see what that research is uh, revealing on that front. Uh, there's another really good uh, question here from Brendan. And he's in, in his work, he's been encountering more and more inquiries about digestate treatment from food waste digesters because they don't have the space to land apply near them or store. Um, I don't know if this is kind of related to some of the, what um, Thomas was talking about, but have an extra capacity as uh, in storage or transfer stations and, and, trucking or moving it around, I guess. But can anyone answer that one? Uh, so if, if I understand the question is, it, it's about capacity uh, basically of, of the food waste. And, and once, you, once you've broken them down, um, depacked them and moved them into uh, the, what we call our hydrolysis pit or tank, um, that is a limiting point. It's a bottleneck in our system. Um, I think uh, if I had it to do over again, I would have uh, had a separate um, on-site facility with just depackaging equipment going into a tank, a much larger tank that could then be used to feed the hydrolysis tank on a daily basis. But we would always have built-in extra capacity Redundancy is extremely important in this business, having the backup or the extra tankage to, to put product into. Um, we're limited, uh, again, by, by our design um, on what we can take and hold. And uh, I, I would envision at some point in time, I've talked about this with our local uh, recycling agencies, is a, a, exactly a transfer station where the food product, the organics could go to be broken down, stored, and then trucked to whatever AD is available to accept it. Um, but again, unless there's uh, state or federal assistance, uh, no one's going to do it unless there's a, a private company that can see a profit in it. And, and I uh, just, uh, Janine, I think also the question was referring to the digestate post AD and you know, just what, finding what can happen with that. Yeah. What, yeah, yeah. Application. So, so curious, you know, Brett and Tom, you know, if, if that presents a challenge from where you sit. Well, from our perspective, so our, our, our solids are going out there, class A EV exceptional value. Uh, it could be used by anybody. Um, and this is going to be a strange um, um, association with this, but it's about marketing. Um, we're wastewater plant operators. We're not marketers. 
we found a farmer that will take it and and we've clung to this guy could we do better could we get paid for it uh make some kind of income out of it maybe but who's going to go out and figure that out for us well we're too busy running a wastewater plant and a food re, uh, a recycling facility um so i and brett's a little bit different i'd let brett uh uh, answer it his way because he's in it as a business. Yeah. So, um, so the solids is what we um, we press our solids out of the the food waste and manure, and we use that as our bedding. So that's that's our bedding for our cows. Um, the liquid is is the challenge, um, and um, so we we generate about twenty million gallons of manure slash food waste a year, and so we have nutrient management permits to allow us to spread that on all the land that we um, farm. And so so we're just land applying it. Um, this this past year was the first year that we um, we used other farmers that didn't have cows but had crops and we basically gave them the manure. And interestingly enough, if we're taking dairy or, or meat products here, it increases the nitrogen value of our manure, which is uh, good for us because that's what we use to grow our corn and hay. And so last year we 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 bought hardly any commercial fertilizers because we had it all in the food waste and the manure. So to your point, Tom, you might have a valuable solid. I don't know what the nitrogen or nutrient content of your your solids are, but it could have some value to somebody. And Tom, I'm curious, can you share how much does it cost for you per gallon to, I guess, um, turn your your sludge or waste into water essentially are you are you, are you you're i assume you're direct directing to a stream or a river yeah yeah so so our uh, we have belt filter press um so all of our our uh, uh, water off the belt filter press is recirculated back to the head of the plant and okay. it's treated as as regular influent um so our only product that we're getting rid of is the biosol oh, okay um i don't have a cost per gallon uh, our plant is uh, averages about three and a half MGD. Um, so it's uh, it's a small part of what we're already treating. Okay. A very, very, very small part. I was just going to type in if uh, the panelists wanted to answer some of these questions directly. Um, that'd be great. Thank you for sharing that article, Nora. I'm going to save the chat. Um, there was a quick question on how do food waste tipping fees compare to landfill fees. Does anyone have an answer I, to that one? And there's I, one more question answer, I have. I'm sorry, my answer will be, we'll always be cheaper than a landfill. Good answer. We are we, we are generally cheaper than a landfill, although when you throw in logistics, depending on how far it comes from, it it might be about the same. Yeah, I'll just jump in to say the digesters are cheaper than the farms, for sure. Um, and there was another question way back when is uh, just about whether there's an average distance that food waste is traveling and what's happening with that. Is that becoming smaller with more competition? Um, I thought that was a good question as well. Uh, from my perspective, we're getting um, uh, food waste from central Pennsylvania. Sorry, Brett. Hey, um, come on. <laughs> All right, we're getting from Western PA. Maybe we should just guys. trade, yeah. <laughs> but we, we also get it from uh, Western Ohio, the whole state of Ohio, West Virginia, <laughs> Western New York. Um, so we've, we've, we have received product from as far away as New Jersey, uh, Richmond, Virginia. It just depends on what the product is and uh, what our prices are and if they're willing to transport it to us. I think that may also depend on, on how it's being collected. You know, if you're talking about food waste, it's being collected in carts at the curb. That That's not going to go too far, you know, in a, in a right. tanker truck. But if you're talking about, you know, a, a, you know, 8,000 gallon tanker truck, maybe that's going to go a little farther, a little more efficiently. So probably depends what it is and how it's being collected. Right. And, and our process is we only take pre-consumer. So it's still, if it's not in a slurry, it's still in packaging. So it could travel as far as, as what the market would be for the, those types of products. Yeah. But it sounds like it's a pretty wide, wide uh, radius right now. Um, all right, well, I, 
did you want to add anything to wrap up, Nora, or? Uh, I think I just want to say a huge thank you. This was an excellent conversation. I appreciate uh, Brett and Tom and Nat and John and Corey uh, for co-moderating and your presentation and Janine for hosting. And uh, just see, Corey mentions the resources CET has, BioCycle, just look around in our archives. We've written a lot about this. We profiled uh, just, well, we owe you one that. So I'm going to be bugging you. Um, that's, <laughs> but yeah, just a huge thank you. And thank you to all for listening and, and enjoy the beautiful weather. Yeah. And I, I learned a lot about barriers and opportunities. And uh, if you guys are interested, we have more of these coming up. The next one will be with Zwitterco on uh, nutrient removal from anaerobic digestate. And then UConn will be coming back again to talk about their SCADA system for anaerobic digesters at wastewater treatment facilities. So if you have any suggestions for future topics, you can email me. But uh, thank you again for joining us, everyone, and have a terrific Friday. Thanks, Nora and Corian. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. And, 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 and that. See you guys. <laughs>